Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the ongoing series of Central Region Science Sharing webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Barb Mays Boosted today from our own NWS office in Omaha Valley, Nebraska. Without further ado, uh, it's all yours. Okay, thanks John, and let me know if there's any problems with my audio coming through. Uh, and thanks to anybody who dialed in today or who's listening to the recording later. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting is, it's not a ton of new research, and most of it isn't even my research, but I, what I wanted to do was collect some information that's out there about uh, climate, different climate signals and how they may be relating to convective signals. We've been getting some questions as we come out of this El Nino about what effect that might have on severe weather this spring. Uh, I, know, I know our office isn't the only one. Um, I thought I'd pr provide some information of what's available and uh, maybe help people at least know where there are some resources to answer some questions. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. This is a bit of a review. Um, with a bit of tools and applications in here too. So what I'm going to look at more specifically are storms as they relate to ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. I'm also going to relate them to the Global Wind Oscillation or uh, the partner of the MJO. That's a very new research that recently came out. And then I'll show some tools that are good for both analyzing past events and looking into future projections and how we might apply those in our weather service offices. So just a few notes when we're using teleconnections. Um, you know, teleconnections, these climate signals can, can tip the scales toward ha having uh, favored synoptic patterns. It doesn't mean that the patterns always look like that, but they do, uh, they can, I should say, uh, at least increase the odds toward certain patterns. It's important to remember that thunderstorms and tornadoes are very small scale events. They're mesoscale to micro scale type of events. So there are a lot of influences that determine whether thunderstorms will develop and whether those thunderstorms will be able to produce tornadoes. But that said, if you have a synoptic pattern that increases the chances for thunderstorms, that in turn can increase the chances for tornadoes. So there is at least some potential to find signals that might be useful to us not only to diagnose things in real time or in retrospect, but maybe even to look ahead uh, to patterns that might favor uh, convective weather in the near or seasonal future. Well, let's start with ENSO, and why are we starting there? Uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one of them being it's one of the best understood climate teleconnection patterns that we have. Um, it can affect the spring synoptic weather patterns uh, across North America, and so is typically thought of in uh, the Northern Hemisphere as a winter phenomenon. It affects our winter patterns, and certainly that's when the effects are at their peak. But uh, ENSO impacts can continue into the spring, early spring, and you know our convective seasons, especially in the southern parts of central region, do get going in the late winter to early spring months. So uh, it is possible for an El Nino or a La Nina to have an influence on the convective season, especially the early part of the convective season. And the patterns that can be uh, induced or favored by an El Nino or a La Nina uh, can influence both the shear and the instability profiles of the atmosphere. And of course, those are two of the ingredients that determine both thunderstorm and tornado activity. Uh, it bears repeating that uh, a synoptic pattern alone does not determine a tornado risk and it doesn't make or break a tornado day, but it can tilt the odds. Uh, it can make it more likely or less likely to have act convective activity. And one of the best things about an uh, ENSO signal is that it is seasonally predictable, more so than any other tech teleconnection pattern that we have. So if we are coming into or going out of an El Nino or La Nina pattern, uh, we can use that and, and leverage it for at least some small signal that could help us out. So let's look a little bit at a typical La Nina and the synoptic patterns associated with it. A typical La Nina is uh, associated with a blocking high in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, with that blocking high comes a more meridional jet flow, a little more north-south into the central United States, and that can increase storminess into North America. It can also bring cold air dumps into the northern part of North America or into the northern central region area. Meanwhile, the uh, southern plains in the southeastern U.S. can be left warm and dry. So what that does is enhance the barrel 
ethnicity across the central United States in particular. Uh, also worth noting, it can be wet in the Ohio Valley, and uh, for those areas that are influenced by hurricane activity, you can see higher than average hurricane activity in a long year, too. In an El Nino, uh, the jet tends to be, uh, well, it tends to be kind of a split flow, actually, and the uh, subtropical component of it tends to be suppressed across the uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, northern Mexico, into the southern plains, and, of course, comes ashore somewhere in California. It tends to be more zonal in nature and leaves the southern and southeastern United States a little more likely to be cool and wet. Meanwhile, the northern plains are often left high and dry, which increases baroclinicity across the continental United States. El Nino, El Nino is also associated with lower than average uh, hurricane activity in the Atlantic, too. So a while back, uh, along with a whole bunch of co-authors, many of whom are in Central Region, we looked at uh, some of the relationships between ENSO and tornado activity specifically. We focused in the north central United States. We found statistically significant relationships between ENSO phase and both the number of tornado days and the number of significant tornadoes. In general, most CWAs in central region had either a non-signal or a tip towards suppressed activity during an El Nino, and most CWAs had either a non-signal or a tip toward enhanced activity in a La Nina. So uh, the statistical results gave us a little bit of a, hmm, that's interesting, that's something going on, so I wonder why that's happening. And our next phase of the study was to create synoptic uh, maps, to create synoptic composites, uh, to see if the uh, synoptic patterns would support these statistical relationships that we found. So by doing that, this is a lot of details about how we did the study. Um, one of the most important parts of this is that we looked at both what, uh, when we were going into a La Nina through the convective season or when we were coming out of a La Nina in the convective season, ditto for El Nino, when we were coming into an El Nino during the convective season or coming out of it. Uh, we also looked at the neutral phase when we stayed neutral throughout the entire convective season. And, and we used the NCEP NCAR reanalysis page that I will show a little bit later in this presentation, at least briefly, to create some of these composites and initially download the data to then make them even prettier, again, with the help of co-authors. So looking at the uh, 300 millibar winds, uh, the background image is the same in all of these, and it's the mean wind from 1950 to 2005. The wind barbs are the wind anomalies. So for example, uh, in, when you're heading into a La Nina or locked into a La Nina, there's this enhanced southwesterly component of the upper level jet across the central United States. Meanwhile, when you're coming out of an El Nino, uh, this easterly component basically means that your jet is suppressed or non-existent. Uh, meanwhile, the jet activity, of course, is enhanced across the Gulf of Mexico and the southern U.S., where the composites would sort of indicate that potential usually. With 500 millibar heights, again, the background shading uh, is the mean and the contours overlaid on it were the anomalies in that period for each of the phases. Again, some interesting ones to point out in La Nina, uh, we tend to see this high stationed off of the coast, off the Pacific coast. Some lower than usual heights across the western and U.S. into the Rockies, indicating the potential maybe for more western U.S. troughing and eastern U.S. ridging, creating, again, southwesterly upper level flow across the central United States. And by contrast, if you look at when we're coming out of an El Nino, you see those higher heights likely across Canada and the northern Rockies into the northern plains. Um, lower heights become more likely associated with that enhanced uh, storm track, that enhanced subtropical jet across the southern U.S., um, leaving us with a, a little bit of a muddle here in the middle, but uh, in short, the tendency toward uh, maybe even a bit of a northeasterly component to our flow around these anomalies, or at least an anomalous easterly component. 700 millibar temperatures, once again, the uh, mean field in the background, the wind barbs are anomalous winds, and the contours are anomalous temperatures. Uh, 700 millibar temperatures are often associated, of course, with some capping. So uh, in a La Nina, uh, we typically see warmer and drier conditions across the southern U.S., and that translates not only at the surface, but up to 700 millibars, where you get maybe a little higher 700 millibar temperatures in place. Um, northern edge of that cap, maybe somewhere in the central plains until you actually encounter 
temperature, lower than usual 700 millibar temperatures in the north central U.S. into the northern Rockies. By contrast, in an El Nino, you have that decreased baroclinicity, so you have the warmer than usual temperatures across the northern plains and the cooler air, anomalously cool air in the southern plains, a little less baroclinicity in between. Looking at 850 millibars, um, once again focusing on when you're going into a La Nina, um, the wind barbs represent anomalous winds, and what this says to me is uh, La Nina sure favors an unusually strong low-level jet across the central United States. Um, another interesting feature is this uh, unusual or anomalous dryness sneaking into the high plains, uh, almost into the central plains. Um, that might be a hint, perhaps, of a dry line feature advancing a little further uh, westward than usual, perhaps. Uh, by contrast, when you're coming out of an El Nino, that low-level jet tends to be suppressed. You have this overall anomalous uh, low, basically, centered oh, around the Gulf Coast, and if this isn't, uh, it's at least suppressed southerly winds, if not actually some potential north to northeasterly wind components coming out of an El Nino. Um, and then finally, another field we looked at were the 700 to 500 millibar lapse rates, again, um, looking for what might suppress or enhance convection. Uh, your lapse rate's a little lower than usual, more negative than usual, I should say. Uh, in the high plains, in La Nina, uh, a little more positive than usual in El Nino. So let's put together some of these maps I've just flown by and uh, relate them to convective patterns, right? Uh, if we're thinking about forecasting convection in the central United States, we might be looking for features like troughing in the west and southwesterly flow, uh, upper level flow, across the central plains. We might be looking for an enhanced low-level jet. We might be looking for a dry line to be advancing into the plains or the central plains. And although I didn't show it here, we might be looking for that surface troughing in the lee of the Rockies. And all of these features were associated with being in a La Nina or going into a La Nina. Uh, so the convective pattern pretty well matches a La Nina composite. Meanwhile, if you look at an El Nino, and especially coming out of an El Nino that was ongoing through the winter. The uh, pattern tends to have an upper level jet that's suppressed southward and zonal, perhaps even split. You have some kind of blocky or ridgy 500 millibar flow pattern, some decreased mid-level baroclinicity, and then this anomalous low, low level low pressure in uh, the southeast United States and or perhaps an anomalous surface high in the central plains. None of that sounds like a really great severe weather pattern, and those patterns would tend to um, become favored during uh, an El Nino, meaning that this is a, again, not that we can't have breakthrough patterns and have days where we have convection, but that the El Nino tips the odds towards this not so favorable pattern in general across the central plains. All of that was uh, bits and pieces from the research that uh, my team and I worked on through about 2008 or 2009. Uh, I kind of abandoned ship at that point to go on to some greener research pastures. Um, other people have done some research that's built upon or leapfrog what I did since then. Uh, nearly Ashton Cook and Joe Schaefer from SPC were working on some research with ENSO that focused in the uh, southern United States, basically the, the southeastern quarter or the eastern half of the United States. I had looked at chunks that were CWA-based. They looked at chunks that were state-based. There are some issues with either methodology, but by and large, we came up with pretty similar results. In these graphics, the uh, blackened counties are ones, or the blackened states, I'm sorry, are ones that are more likely to see uh, an enhanced uh, tornado activity during these phases. The hatched ones tend to see suppressed, and the gray ones are kind of in between. Um, now, this is for wintertime tornadoes, January, February, March. So let's face it, Michigan, Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, Indiana, we're not getting a ton of wintertime tornadoes. These results are really more robust for the uh, southern United States into the southeastern United States. Um, but what they say, even if you just kind of blur your eyes and, and take a glance, is that neutral to La Nina patterns are the ones that might typically favor wintertime tornado activity in the eastern United States. Meanwhile, an El Nino pattern tends to suppress it or only enhance it, if, basically, if you live in Florida or North Carolina. 
Uh, one more study that was more recent uh, took the, a more gridded approach, which is probably a, a little more robust than a, a CWA or a state-based approach. And uh, this was by John Allen et al., published in 2015. Uh, what they found is looking at both tornado and hail uh, during El Nino and La Nina patterns. I'm showing the tornado here, but the hail results are very similar. Again, what you need to do is just, just glance at the top images or blur your eyes and look at the bottom two images and see that La Ninas tend to be associated with increased tornado activity and El Ninos tend to be associated with decreased tornado activity. In these maps, uh, this is looking at March, April, and May, and uh, grid boxes that have a cross in them or a plus mark in them are ones that were significant statistically. So uh, these relationships are, are pretty clear both when looking at the statistics of the tornadoes themselves and when looking at the synoptic patterns that would support these results. I'm going to jump now to looking at a whole different thing, which would be the GWO, the Global Wind Oscillation. This is brand new research, and I'm just really getting into interpreting it and using it myself. So my apologies if I stumble through a little bit. The paper is available, and uh, I have it or can link it for anybody who is curious about it. Uh, but it received a fair amount of press when it was released because what it's doing is using uh, the Global Wind Oscillation, or essentially the MJO, to track uh, sub-seasonal convective activity and look for higher probabilities of tornadoes during certain MJO phases. Uh, the, the why of how it works is associated with angular momentum transfer, and then we're going to start really getting technical and nerdy. Um, I don't want to get too far into the nerdy stuff, but I'll touch on it a little bit. But first, just for some familiarity about MJO, there are eight phases of the MJO, and uh, these are simply some temperature composites for March, April, and May based on each of those MJO phases. I didn't have clean synoptic charts to show you like we do for uh, El Nino and La Nina, but these can give you some idea of how different patterns might be favored during the different MJO phases. Looking again at uh, precipitation, again, phases uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and then from 8 you jump back to 1 as a, a sort of a circular pattern that continues. MJO is not always active. It's more active during El Nino seasons. It's less active or even inactive, especially during a La Nina. Um, sometimes it's more robust than others. I'm going to actually back step a couple to this uh, phase-based tracking. If the MJO is tracking more on the outskirts of this eight, this uh, phase space here, this eight components of the uh, MJO phases, then it's a stronger event. And the closer it's winding into the middle, the weaker of an event that it is and the less influence it's likely to be having overall. So in this diagram, we're starting here on the brink of phases six and seven and expected to progress through to phase eight by around the end of uh, March. And then uh, this was downloaded a couple weeks ago. And then uh, projected to have a weakened MJO phase uh, continuing into April. What Jen Sini and his co-author found was that the phases of 8, 1, and 2, we're now looking across to go 8 down here, 1 and 2 at the top, are the ones that tend to be associated with increased convective or tornado activity across the United States. They do look at the United States as a whole. Um, the reasons for this are, again, related to uh, uh, global angular momentum transfer and uh, on anomalies in traditional torque. This is, again, getting really nerdy, and I don't want to go too far into it, but let's just say that it ends up favoring a pattern of troughing over the western United States. That probably sounds kind of familiar. Uh, some water vapor flux uh, from the Gulf of Mexico northward uh, when we go east of the Continental Divide. And then positive theta E advection in the lee of the Rocky Mountains. All of these things sound pretty favorable for convective potential in the central United States. These are things we look at when we're trying to forecast for it. So what we're uh, inducing with this flow in phases 8, 1, and 2 is essentially additional moisture and instability, which aids tornado-producing thunderstorms. It's not the whole story, but it certainly does help. Based on that, um, Victor is now running the ERTAF, the Extended Range Tornado Activity Forecast, and it makes a Week 2 and Week 3 US-wide outlook for tornado activity. Um, he, he uses three categories, forecasting above normal or above average, that's the AA on this chart, below average, the BA, 
or A for average amount of activity. And uh, the link is, again, here, and you can follow this and follow his, his forecast as well as his verification. This is a new feature as well, and I don't really have a good feel for how it's going to verify or what it's going to look like as we go through this season, but I think it will be really interesting to watch it. And I do believe I, uh, Victor has recently taped an episode of Weather Geeks that's on the Weather Channel, and uh, probably will be talking about this too. So why are we stopping at just those two patterns? There are a lot of teleconnection patterns out there. There's the Arctic Oscillation, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Pacific North American, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. I can keep going, but I won't. The main reason is that nobody's researched it yet. Either the research isn't conclusive at this point or hasn't really been tapped yet. This is really, uh, this area of research has a high potential for the future. And, uh, if I was a university professor or working more closely with a university, I sure would be encouraging a student or two to take this on, especially the NAO, because the NAO, unlike most teleconnections, is actually traceable and trackable through the summer. Most teleconnections kind of fall off in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, but not NAO. So, uh, boy, I'd really like to see that one get going. Maybe that's something I'll work on next. We'll see. Well, I wanted to give you guys a few tools to wrap up our, our discussion. Um, one set of tools is a way to look at the past to come up with those weather patterns or look at past weather patterns like I was doing with reanalysis. Just a very brief primer in case you're not familiar with reanalysis. It's basically a model's interpretation of past conditions updated periodically. Uh, they have a background field that's stationary for the entire period of reanalysis. And it gives us basically a complete global gridded data uh, that's fairly homogeneous with many derived fields, not just the standard heights and temperatures, but you can get everything from heating to soil moisture, um, for which observations are absent. So take that with the appropriate grains of salt. Uh, on one hand, hey, we can't prove it wrong because we don't have observations. On the other hand, we, we can't really verify it either. So um, just keep it in mind if you're looking at reanalysis of what might be uh, able to be verified or not. Um, so what I'm going to throw out for you guys here and probably just leave it at that is a whole bunch of ESREL reanalysis links. And again, if you're watching this at home, you can pause this and, and take a look at these links and look them up. Um, this is a, a wealth of information. I, I can't even begin to describe the wealth of information that's available through the ESREL reanalysis site and available to anybody to use. You can go in there and make composites to your heart's content. But let's move on a little bit into predictive mode. And we're going to do it mainly by focusing on the climate forecast system, or CFS model. Why? Because it's what we have. Um, the CFS model is actually version 2. It's a coupled atmospheric and ocean, sea ice, and land model. It's run four times per day with control runs at 0, 6, 12, and 18Z. Um, and then there are additional runs that are sprinkled in there to get additional shorter term runs and one set of additional uh, seasonal runs. Uh, these are often gathered up into an ensemble by using um, all of these different runs within a day and then maybe even looking at the past several days and combining those into an ensemble to represent the possibilities for a few weeks to several seasons or three month periods out in advance. I've linked here to the weekly data from, from uh, the CPC website. There are also monthly and seasonal plots I'm going to add just a small asterisk here, and this is only going to be relevant for a short time, but uh, at least right now, at the end of March in 2016, um, there are issues with uh, the CFS and uh, issues with its depiction of a uh, cold pool of, of oceanic temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean that's disturbing its ability to run seasonal, uh, seasonal outlets right now. It's in fact being tossed out of the ENSO composites because it's so far off. Um, they're working on a patch that is or should be implemented at any time, and eventually we'll work on a permanent fix as well. But just be aware, uh, if something looks funny at the monthly to seasonal scale, it might be related to uh, this initialization issue. Besides CPC, there are a number of other sources out there that have taken the CFS output and made it into something more useful than just probabilities of temperatures and probabilities of precipitation in the usual categories. So one of those is the Hop Wharf site. Many of you might know this is run by Tom Holtquist in uh, Chan Hassan Forecast Office. And, 
And uh, in this page, at the link that I show, there are actually several different pages of Hopworth links of the CFS output, but there's an entire page dedicated to convective output, looking at probabilities of CAPE, storm relative helicity, and or uh, convective precipitation or laid on each other. Uh, so that you can identify potential areas of increased convective activity from weeks three to six. The output of it looks something like this map. Uh, I downloaded this one today. So this is, um, it's a 20 member ensemble with the 0, 06, 12, and 18Z control runs over the last five days. And I looked at the probability of CAPE over 1500, 0 to 3 SRH over 150, and with uh, convective precipitation. Um, so if that was the case, then if this verifies the week of Thursday, April 14th to April 21st, then the state of Kansas and maybe into Nebraska ought to be paying attention. Now, this is like any model, right? In any one forecast model that you use, there are biases, there are trends, there are days it does well and days it doesn't. Some signals are easier to forecast than others. Sometimes you do get very consistent signals for weeks leading up to an event, and sometimes you get one rogue run that you know blows up a bunch of convection and then it's gone in the next one. Um, so if you want to use these models effectively, you, it, they take some time to get to know and interpret and understand. So you know it might not be the best thing to just pop in there one day and look at the models and, and take it at face value, but rather to follow them like you would the GFS or the NAM as you go through a series of shifts. The uh, Storm Prediction Center also uses the CFS. This was originally set up by Greg Carbon, um, but it will continue after his departure from SPC. And this is the CFS dashboard. It's affectionately known as the Chiclet diagram. And uh, the gist of understanding it is that blue boxes indicate low convective activity. Uh, brightly colored ones, and especially ones with little X's on them, indicate that uh, in the domain that's covered by this particular run, um, they have identified some coverage of areas where the SCP, or the supercell composite parameter, is over 1. Um, in other words, indicating that there is the potential for some convective activity. And it works by interpreting this such that we're going through uh, run dates as we go from bottom to top, and actual dates as we go from left to right. So the closer we get to the top of this, uh, the closer we are to when uh, we reach the run date, uh, and the actual date converging on each other. If you have a series like, for example, this set of filled in, colored in, X'd in boxes leading up to a date, that indicates that the model had some consistency in producing a convective si signal as the day approached. Um, sometimes it looks a little bit more like this, where you have a you have a hit, and then several days of nothing, and then maybe a couple hits, and then several days of nothing again. Those are those days that are not so consistent in the signal. Our most recent couple of convective days did show up in here. Um, if you lived in eastern Nebraska, the convection was a little bit of a disappointment, but other places were convectively active yesterday and continue to be today. And uh, this is actually the forecast for today that was produced 10 days ago by the CFS. And you might remember from the page before, there was some consistent signal that there would be convective activity. The center of activity has shifted around day to day. Um, but in short, it is at least projecting that there is some signal for convective activity in the southern United States, uh, which overall isn't too terrible of a diagnosis 10 days in advance. So how do we use these kinds of tools and apply them? Um, I think one really important and emerging way we can apply this information is in decision support. Uh, I wouldn't go showing these models and maps to your emergency managers, but they might help you understand patterns that could be upcoming, and they might help you provide a, a, an exceptional lead time if things are looking a little bit uh, robust that there may be an enhanced potential for convection. For example, here in the Omaha County Warning Area, we host the College World Series every summer in late June, which is a convectively active time for us, typically. And I might be following the CFS as this approaches to you know, give a little tip to the emergency manager if it looks like that pattern might be on the active side during the College World Series. And if you have events that are scheduled out far enough in advance, you might be able to look ahead and think, well, you know, we've got a crowd of 100,000 people and, you know, that chiclet map's been hot red for several days. Maybe we should 
give them a little heads up that the pattern might be favorable for some convection. Uh, another way that this could be applied, again, is just with in-office situational awareness. If you can anticipate when those busy periods are occurring or anticipate some consistent signals, and you look ahead and you've got a calendar full of leave, uh, maybe that's a way that you can at least have some contingency plans made well in advance instead of needing to wait until the few days before it. All right, so all of that said, everybody wants to know what's going to happen this year. So let me talk a little bit about this year and uh, start by saying I have no idea what's going to happen this year because so many other factors besides El Nino and these subseasonal uh, signals can happen. But what I can tell you is that we've had an antecedent El Nino. It is decreasing in strength, but it also is still influencing the atmospheric circulation, and it will continue to do both. Uh, for the next couple of months. It will continue to decrease in strength and it will continue to influence our atmospheric circulation. So I've pulled out all of those maps from earlier in the presentation just for uh, the maps that apply to coming out of an El Nino when you have that antecedent El Nino. As a reminder that in general um, the pattern is you know tips toward not being very favorable for widespread persistent convection across the season when you look at the season. Um, that doesn't mean we can't have breakthrough events, and certainly it only takes one tornado to make somebody's day really bad. So um, these are really important to take with some grains of salt. But just for our own awareness, yes, during uh, or when we're coming out of El Nino events, it is typical for there to be a little bit less than usual convective activity. It doesn't mean it will happen like that this year, but it means that that, that potential is there. Um, there's also to keep in mind that potential transition to a La Nina in the late summer to early fall. Um, maybe that means we get more active as the later season progresses, and uh, this, didn't, this study doesn't really look at the later season convective activity. And also to keep in mind that there are these subseasonal influences like MJO activity that may give us periods of increased activity and periods of decreased activity. Uh, so all in all, I put it in there, roll the dice, and um, I think maybe if we lean quiet but still have the potential for active days, um, that's a pretty act fair description of how past El Nino events have behaved. Um, I've kept this on the brief side so that uh, hopefully people are still listening, and by all means, if you have any questions, feel free to give me an email. I've put my phone number on there, but of course I work shift work, so you know how difficult that can be to get a hold of somebody. Um, I also have a Twitter handle you can follow. I'm sure I'll be tweeting about this as, as the season progresses, too. And uh, with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Barb. Uh, excellent uh, presentation today. And if you wish to uh, ask a question, uh, you can either raise your hand with the GoToMeeting software, uh, put a question in, or even put it on the chat. So uh, and then I'll unmute your, uh, your line. So, any questions? Okay, uh, looks like Dave Brown has a question, but I can't unmute you because uh, you have to put in your audio pin. <laughs> but let's see if we've got it here. Uh, while we're waiting on that, uh, we have a question from Larry Ruthie. So, uh, let's see if... Uh, Larry, uh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, given that the El Nino uh, this year has concentrated convection farther west in the Pacific than in the classic uh, canonical El Nino, how do you feel that may affect the composites that, uh, that you've studied uh, regarding the, uh, the flow over the central plains? Boy, that's a great question, Larry. And you'll notice I didn't try to break down the analysis I did, or uh, none of the authors I've seen have broken down their analyses by different types of El Nino. And where that warm pool is, whether it's farther west, in the Pacific or a more of a modiki that's in the central Pacific certainly can influence the downstream patterns. Uh, the further west events tend to behave a little more like your average ones, but um, you know that kind of variability is exactly why we say that no two El Nino events are alike and uh, I, I don't know specifically how it will influence this upcoming season, but uh, I would say yes it probably will influence it in some different way than the, the usual pattern. Did that answer your question, uh, Larry? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Okay, great. And now we'll go... 
Oh, sorry. Did you have something else? I'm sorry. I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> I, would, I could make a lot of money if I knew all the answers to these questions. No. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go to Dave Brown to our south. Uh, Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Hey, John. Good afternoon. I'm here with Victor and, and Jack Sonmar at Center Region. Thanks, Barb, for um, going through this. A lot of interesting stuff here. I think we have maybe a couple questions. I'll start with one. Um, I was hoping you could go back just a couple slides to um, you had a couple of, um, you know, what happens, what's going to happen this spring teasers, and you had one of those slides that had five images on it. I was hoping you could just walk through these again. Uh, we got a little lost in which, which one was which. So maybe just kind of for everybody on the phone, remind us what the, the variables are in these. You bet, Dave, and I'm yeah, Dave, always I'm glad you always Southern glad Region you people are there to there give me a lot of questions. Lot of questions. On the top left, the top we have left, the 250 the... millibar winds, and uh, the mean field is in the shading. The anomalous wind barbs are depicted here. Um, what this shows is that anomalously strong jet across uh, Mexico to the Gulf of Mexico and maybe into the southern United States. Meanwhile, a signature is for a potentially uh, suppressed jet or uh, even an unusual high up here in the northern plains. That shows up also on the next chart below it, which is the 500 millibar analysis. That's mean heights in the background image and anomalies in the contours. So um, what we see is anomalous ridging or an anomalous high in Canada reaching into the northern Rockies or northern plains. And then this anomalous low in uh, the southern plains tied to where that jet is usually most likely to be streaming across the southern US. And then in the bottom left here, this is our 700 millibar chart. And again, the background image is the uh, mean temperature field. The contours are the anomalous temperatures and the vectors are anomaly, wind anomalies at that level. So um, what we're seeing in here is the potential that reduced baroclinicity across North America with a anomalously warm temperatures in Canada to the northern plains, anomalous cooling in the southern plains to southeastern U.S., and uh, at least perhaps some suppressed uh, 700 millibar flow, if not even anomalous northeastern component. Up to the upper right, we have the 850 millibar ch chart, and again, the background shading is anomalous, is, I'm sorry, mean moisture. The contours are moisture anomalies, and the vectors are winds. Uh, what this says to me is that the low-level jet tends to be suppressed uh, on the average through uh, the spring following an El Nino. Um, and then finally, these lapse rates here uh, at the bottom, that's the mean field in the shading. The anomalies are in contours indicating a more positive anomaly or decreased lapse rate uh, across the central plains. Dave, does that help clear it up? Great. That, thanks, Barb. I really appreciate that uh, walking through these. It would be interesting, um, the sample size would be very small and not statistically significant, but it would be interesting to, to uh, redo these just for uh, spring seasons coming out of strong antecedent El Ninos. I'd be curious to see what kind of variations there might be. But, uh, Victor's got a comment, too, so I'll turn over. I mean, before Victor comments, I actually want to comment on that. Um, because what I also did, be, uh, there were some springs that jumped straight from an El Nino to a La Nina. And uh, because I didn't know whether to classify those as coming out of an El Nino or going into a La Nina, I threw out those years. But interestingly, those are often the years that are strong El Ninos. So uh, I really do think there would be some value in going back and compositing those. Thanks, Barb. Go ahead, Victor. Yeah, hey, Barb. Hi, Victor. Hi, Victor. Yeah, hey, how you doing? Hey, just real quick, um, um, good point to mention the problems with the CFS V2. You know, as you know, we've been on some calls with headquarters and CPC, et cetera, Mike Halpert about it. Um, I traded some emails with Dave DeWood, I guess, on Monday. I think he sent out to all the regions that they apparently were able to uh, load the fix on Monday, which would have been, what, three days ago. So the quote-unquote new uh, initialization parameters for CFS v2 are now uh, in, the, in the model starting Monday. I think the best of my knowledge, it, it, you know, it, it's all run in 10-day increments. You have E3, which is the most recent 10 days. I think E2, um, if you want to go to the CFSV2 page, um, E3 is the most recent 10 days, E2 is the middle 10 days, and E1 is the last 10 days. So it's going to take probably at least 10 days for all the 
you know, bad data, quote unquote, to get flushed out of the system. That's true for the and seasonal also, outlooks. It, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also as you pointed out, um, for and as, as as the folks from CPC were good enough to tell us, I mean, these these problems basically manifest themselves. But what would they, they say, 30 days or beyond? So for the first 30 days, up, up through week four, should not be any problems with the CFSV2. And I think I think the Greg Carbon to, uh, severe weather threat or uh, tornado threat showed that pretty well, um, despite the fact that CFSV2 is, you know, having known problems. Um, as you pointed out, Barb, you know, for the last 10 days, it's been really well, uh, you know, the enhanced tornado signal, enhanced severe weather signal across the southern plains for yesterday and for today. Yes, and yes, um, a, good uh, a good point to make and reinforce is that, that even with the even CFS with having the problems it was, it was okay, it was for, okay about for about the first, first several weeks seven to weeks six weeks or so. It was more on the uh, longer term scales that the CFS was, uh, the problems were manifesting themselves. Okay, uh, any okay. other questions? Uh, any other questions? Okay, um, I believe uh, Brian Hurst, did you have a comment you'd like to make? Maybe he uh, had to step away uh, for a moment. Uh, he did put a comment on here. It says, um, it says, thanks, Barb, for the example of the CWS in your CWA and following the Chicklet diagram to monitor possibility of severe weather and discussions with EM and thinking ahead during peak leave. Great example of how to use these products. So, yeah, nice comment there from Brian. Thank you, Brian. Any other questions? Okay, very good. Uh, any last minute uh, comments you'd like to make, Barb? I don't think so, but if uh, people do think of questions or if there are webinar listeners who think of questions later, uh, by all means, please send me an email. Very good, thank you. And we will uh, have been recording this and we will have it available to everyone uh, within the next day or so. Well, take care everyone. Thank you again for joining us uh, for the continuing Central Region SSD Science Sharing webinars. And Barb, thank you again uh, for a great presentation. Thanks, John. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.